Uh, welcome everyone back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. Those of you who are joining us for the first time, well, you've picked a special time to join us today because we're talking about technology. And before we go there, um, just a reminder that we are the UK's largest pro-marriage organisation representing tens of thousands of individuals and groups who support this thing, one man, one woman marriage. We think it's really special. We think it's unique. We think it needs to be preserved and promoted. And that's not to say other things don't take place in society because they clearly do. But we just think that this concept of what we would call real marriage is very special and needs to be taken care of. One of the one of the many attacks on marriage these days is coming from a technology front. And it's a real privilege to have with us today somebody who knows an awful lot about this subject, somebody called Jason Thacker. Now, Jason is the chair of research in technology ethics. Uh, he's also the, the director of the Research Institute for the um, Ethics and uh, Religious Liberty Commission in the US. Jason, what a privilege to have you with us. Would you like to say hello to our viewers and our listeners? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. Well, Jason, it's a huge privilege. I know you're a busy guy, and it's it's a really uh, great opportunity for us to talk to you. Do you want to? As, you're you're a popular author. You're a speaker. Um, you do such an awful lot of stuff. Is do you want to give us a brief background to yourself and your work? Yeah, for sure. Well, as you said, I, I work at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission. We are the public policy arm of the nation's largest, the U.S.'s largest Protestant denomination. Uh, of the Southern Baptist Convention. And so we focus on a lot of policy fronts, but also one of the things that I oversee is all of our research, specifically into Christian ethics. So we kind of cover the gamut of issues from marriage and sexuality to pro-life issues, uh, to human dignity issues and uh, international issues and religious liberty issues. And one of the issues that kind of permeates all of those is actually the role of technology. It's yeah. something I've written a lot about, and especially in some of my books in terms of the digital public square, is talking about the role of technology in our society and how it's shaping and forming us as people on our outlook on a lot of the big pressing moral and social issues of our day. And this isn't just happening here, obviously, in the United States. It's happening around the world as many of these technology companies operate in what are known as transnational entities. They're not just in one domestic location. Yep. They're actually reaching across all of the world and they're shaping the public conversation. And I think it's wise for us to be aware of the way that technology is shaping and forming us as people, because that has a direct impact on a, a number of social mm. issues, not less than uh, issues of marriage and sexuality. And let's get into some of that straight away. And I've, I've read some of your material and it's great and I would commend it to people. I've also read a book by uh, one of your senators in the US, a chap called uh, Josh Hawley, and he's written a book called The Tyranny of Big Tech. Uh, and he makes the case in that book that the technology companies these days, the big ones, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, YouTube, uh, lots of other big companies that really, uh, they're the equivalent to what the railway companies were back in the day, because uh, they lay down the tracks on which everything travels, all the information, and the communication that we have these days in terms of society and everything that we share with each other. It's going through their networks and that they have the power that the railway companies had and the money in terms of influencing the agenda. And he makes the point that, you know, they, they have a specific agenda of their own. And we've seen that in many examples. So we've seen uh, Amazon banning certain books on certain subjects. We've seen YouTube canceling uh, channels and videos that they don't agree with. Uh, we've had PayPal at one point offering to uh, or threatening to withhold money and in fact take money from people who say things they don't like. We know what Twitter's been like in the past. Hopefully that's changing now. So there is a big tyranny involved in big tech and uh, perhaps I'll get you to comment on that a little bit and then uh, just so our viewers know we'll move on to look at emerging threats around artificial intelligence around general intelligence specifically some of the biases that seem to be built in there just so people are aware of some of these things and uh, perhaps we can finish with what do we do about it and how do we defend marriage in such an environment so firstly in terms of just the general threats that big tech is giving us do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, I can't speak directly to Senator Hawley's argument in the book, but he's part of a larger conversation that's happening really around the world, but specifically here in the United States as we talk about the role of technology companies in the public square and in the nature of public communication. Obviously, so much of our communication these days is mediated through these online means, whether it's social media, through email, through the internet, through digital technology, even allowing us to have an interview like this, is that in many ways we are hosted and having many, many benefits um, to be able to use these various communication channels. And what Senator Hawley is kind of referencing the idea of the railway companies and such is that there's a larger argument, especially happening here in the States, but really around the world, 
about the role of these technology companies, as well as the role of government in this. And there's a widespread debate, actually, even among many prominent conservatives and liberals alike about the role of big tech. One of the interesting things, at least here in the United States, is that whether you're on the political left or right, we're all recognizing that there's an immense power that technology companies have in the public square and over our public communication. There's that's kind of where the agreement breaks down to is where we say, well, what do we do about it? Is the, does the government have a larger role in that? Do technology companies have a larger responsibility? What's the role of individuals and families and even churches and synagogues and mosques? How do we play into those conversations and how do we shape kind of the the public and mo uh, the moral order of our society today? And technology is one of those. That's something that I kind of focus on in my work specifically is that technology is forming and shaping us. For many of us, when I say that, we're we're kind of we're, we pull back a little bit and say, well, I thought technology was just a tool. It's just a neutral tool that we use. We can use it for good, we can use it for evil, but it's just nearly a neutral tool. I think one of the things we've all realized around the world, especially in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, as we were thrust into these online environments, we very quickly see, especially on social media, that technology is not a neutral tool. It's forming and shaping our perspective. And from a Christian perspective, I say that it's shaping our understanding of God, shaping our understanding of ourselves, which actually I think is one of the most important questions we ask today is what does it mean to be human? Especially in light of, I know some of the things we'll get to in, in light of chat GPT and artificial intelligence, you're, we're asking some very fundamental questions of what does it mean to be human and what is the common good and what is the moral and social order, what it should be, especially in relation of, uh, as you said, real marriage between one man, one woman for a lifetime, that permanent union uh, that as a Christian I see as God kind of instituting into society, creating us male and female. But even if you don't come from a theistic uh, perspective, realizing the centrality of the marriage and the family in our society, that it's a fundamental building block of entire society. And so you see that in terms of how we understand ourselves and the world around us and how we see our neighbors, how that shapes our interactions with others. Because often so much of our life is being mediated through digital means. And there's a very interesting question that's being asked around the world, but specifically here in the United States is, what role does the government have in shaping the policies, especially the content moderation policies of private companies? Especially here in the States, we have very first strong, uh, strong First Amendment principles in terms of free speech and free expression, also with religious freedom. And so what does that look like? Is that just for individuals? Is that also for private companies? The Supreme Court here in the United States has ruled time and time again that private corporations do have freedom of expression. Uh, these are private entities. Uh, they also have fiduciary responsibilities to their stakeholders and their shareholders. So we have this very interesting question about how do we shape kind of the, the moral and social order of our day in realizing that nothing is neutral. I think that's one of the biggest things that we can take away from a debate like this, especially about the, even the role of religion in the public square or various kind of moral and social norms like marriage is what role uh, do our beliefs, our fundamental beliefs have in society and realizing that we're all bringing these fundamental beliefs into the public square. There's nothing that's this viewpoint neutrality is a total myth. We can't not operate out of these deeply held beliefs because they shape everything about us, including our public and social interaction. And when we see that mediated through technology, we have some very, very interesting questions on stake. No area more so than for children. And yeah. it's, you know, social media for children. I, I think when you look at things like the, 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 the trans epidemic, which is happening in, in your country and in ours, and how uh, the, the, the huge influence of social media in driving that sort of thing, and things like TikTok. Um, Josh mentions that in his book. You've referred to that in some of your material. And I would, I would challenge any parents of a child who uses TikTok to spend two hours solidly, which is at least as much as your kids are spending on TikTok, and just scroll through and see what it starts to feed you. And it, and if you if you can let your child use TikTok after you've done that for two consecutive hours, well, you know, I, I don't know what's going on because it's just unbelievable debauchery and this is the funny thing and and that's that's not coming at it from a christian perspective but just an objective perspective that it's completely over sexualized and for mm. for young people the the that whatever's going on in the algorithm is just not doing anybody any good. And, uh, you know, we need, first of all, from a, a parental point of view, I think parents need to realize that, as you've said quite rightly, these things are not neutral. 
um, yeah. that you know the, the content is is in many cases and in most cases pretty dangerous. Yeah, it really is, and it's interesting that you bring up TikTok because uh, one of the interesting debates with TikTok is even the way that um, it's used in other countries, whether it's in the West where we have uh, kind of this free for all in many ways, our children in many ways are um, either addicted or spending a lot of time on social media apps from Instagram to uh, TikTok and other video sharing platforms. And the type of content that is being fed through these algorithms and shaping and forming, it's interesting because you go to other places, especially China, as ByteDance is a Chinese-based company that's often uh, kind of in the back pocket in many ways of the Chinese Communist Party, they have very different rules for their children. The Chinese Co uh, Communist Party actually limits the amount of time that children can spend and also the type of content that they receive. They actually receive much more educational content. But especially in the West, it's a lot more kind of fun and games and videos and even overly sexualized content kind of pushing us down these rabbit holes. And so it's very interesting to see that even a tool like TikTok is being used in two very different ways because it's intended. All things are intended to shape our behavior, to shape our perspective on the world. And I think it's high time for all of us to realize that the technology industry plays a significant role in public conversation, also plays a significant role in the moral and social order. The question is, what do we do about it. And that's really where the, the breakdown in many ways happens, especially here in the United States, but really throughout the West, about how do we approach the role of government individuals, as well as these private entities that have such an outsized role in our public conversation today. Mm, mm. And that's the problem because you they 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 deprioritize messages that are around supporting uh, marriage and healthy relationships and and you know maybe not having sex before marriage, maybe man woman marriage, all those sorts of things. All those kind of uh, messages are deprioritized and uh, are generally speaking replaced or or what gets prioritized is messages which say very different things. More a more kind of liberal permissive message is the one that seems to get priority through the algorithms and and that's where it's quite damaging from a marriage perspective in terms of uh, kids just almost being subliminally hypnotized into thinking oh those are the right things not what my parents are telling me or even you know my parents were brought up on those things too so where on earth am I going to get that teaching from because more often it's not in the schools neither these days. So there is that inbuilt damage and that's one thing and we would encourage, well, I suppose two things I would encourage, A, parents to to realize what's going on and spend a couple of hours on, for example, TikTok uh, or, uh, and Instagram, uh, but also to actually you know, provide useful content yourself if that's something you feel you can do, which is meaningful and kind of puts the balance there. But I wonder if we can move on because Yes, yeah, social media, we know about that, we're familiar with it. And also we know that a lot of the um, executives that work for social media companies do not let their children use the social media apps. You know, their young children, they, they wait until they're much older, which is very interesting and very telling. But beyond that, we've got this notion of... Um, artificial intelligence coming along and uh, there's been a lot in the news about chat GPT which is an example I know Microsoft have released something based on a similar model as well uh, and these things have accumulated a user base faster than any other technology in history mm -hmm. yeah so there's been a massive explosion but for those of our viewers who don't understand what these things are tell us for example what what is chat GPT what is it yeah, before we get to that, I just want to mention one and kind of highlight one thing you said is the role of parents. Um, that's especially important, not just in terms of social media, but even emerging technologies like artificial intelligence is that personal responsibility, that pursuit of personal virtue in realizing that the family, specifically parents, mothers and fathers have the primary role of shaping uh, their children and their outlook on the world. So much of our time, we often kind of hand screens to our children, kind of uh, unaided or even unfiltered sometimes and just allow them to watch these things for hours on end. Um, our, we're, we uh, would often realize that, you know, we're not digital natives, as they would say. Uh, we didn't often grow up on a lot of these technologies, and that has a very formative effect on us as well. Uh, there are many adults also are being incredibly shaped in terms of how we view truth and responsibility and even our identities, especially in a polarized or tribalized society. That's having uh, extreme effects on our children as well and how we shape that. And so I think that especially as we talk about marriage and we talk about the centrality of family in our society is to recognize that 
that, yes, this is going on in our society. And yes, there may be some public means to mitigate that or to shape that conversation. And we should pursue those for sure. But also the role and responsibility and the agency of parents and families to be shaping that conversation for their children. And nothing more important than even kind of some of the emerging technologies that we see with artificial intelligence. Um, essentially, artificial intelligence is a broader category is simply non-biological intelligence. Now, that kind of seems obviously kind of self-explanatory, but it's essentially the ability of a machine to perform human-like tasks in terms of thinking or decision making or even what we're seeing now with generative AI, which is generating various pieces of content from writing and art and video and audio. It's generating these things that have that the sense of being creative or original, but they also are a combination of things that it's learned. Uh, these aren't uh, sentient machines. These are conscious machines. They're not aware of what they're doing. It's simply a very complex kind of math problem in many ways if we dumb it down. And it's processing vast amounts of data. But the interesting thing is the way we become kind of reliant upon these machines, especially with ChatGPT and how that shapes our perspective of the world, because we ask it a question and it gives us a response. And if we think that's an objective response or that's an adequate representation of reality, um, we're fooling ourselves. Again, nothing is neutral, not even ChatGPT. And so that's, I think, raises some very interesting questions about how it shapes our worldview or our philosophy or our understanding of the world around us in particular in terms of marriage and sexuality issues in a culture that's inflamed and a culture that is hyper-sexualized in every single aspect uh, with the sexual revolution that's happening around the world. And I think that's high time for many of us to step into these conversations and see the formative effects of technology. Yeah. And for anybody who doesn't or wants to go and experience um, chat GPT, for example, um, uh, I think the, the, the web address is chat.openai.com and you can go there and you can set yourself up a free account. And I think it was launched at the end of November 2022. Mm -hmm. But it really does seem um, to a lot of people like magic. Because yeah. so, for example, my son uh, is uh, uh, finishing his engineering degree. And when this came out at the end of November, he was uh, obviously he's into tech and he was one of the, the first people on it. Uh, and he showed it to his tutor uh, and his tutor was silent and then got the whole of the engineering school together and said, we now need to change the way in which we assess our students immediately. Because so, for example, uh, if, if you want somebody to write an essay, you can put your essay title into Jack chat GPT and say write me an essay of a thousand words on this subject and within a second it will start writing that essay uh, and you can ask it then to tailor it specifically and it, it it's a model based on predictive text because it, it's read it's read the, the rest of the internet and it, it writes something which it thinks you will see as credible which may well be correct or not. I mean, that's another problem with it. Um, but it writes something which sounds credible. And it also will write code for you. So he was he was asking it to write code to do a certain thing or to get a bit of hardware working. And it would just write the code that it would have taken him a week sitting down, pouring over books and getting the code. It was there. So it changes all sorts of assessments and all sorts of um, uh, the way people do things and the way we work, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, anything that involves written stuff suddenly there's a fundamental change. But there's a big but, because I asked it, for example, um, to summarize, I'm a, an avid reader, and I asked it to pick out the main points of some books, uh, for example, and it's very good at doing that, asking it, testing it to do that. Um, I asked it, for example, now, let me make the point, Jason, we have supporters from all faiths and none, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Christians, a lot of supporters who are uh, atheists, um, uh, agnostics, and other faiths too. But I asked it, for example, um, uh, tell me in which ways the film Toy Story uh, exemplifies the five points of Calvinism, right? <laughs> really bizarre question. And it wrote me a piece hmm. on 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 the, the, the scenes in Toy Story that represent the... F absolutely astonishing, right? But there we are. It did it. Absolutely amazing. Um, but then I asked it, for example, give me, uh, give me a summary of the book Same Sex Parenting Research by Walter Shum. And um, instead of giving me a summary... It gave me a criticism of the book and said, well, actually, mm. this book is flawed. It's based on bad research and a wrong interpretation and false analysis. Now, that's really interesting because that's not true. 
<laughs> it's you know it's it's a holistic approach looking at the research in a very objective way uh the broad research on that particular subject and this is because um as well as just being uh, an AI bot that's gone out there and looked at the whole of the internet to see how things are written, it's been tweaked for what the developers call safety. So nobody gets hurt by the responses. And uh, as it's going forward, it's getting tweaked more and more and more. And this is a problem when it comes to things like real marriage. If you're a supporter of real marriage, if you look at for the arguments and the evidence in support of real marriage, well, it'll come back and it'll say, actually, maybe you shouldn't be looking for this because, you know, there are there are a lot of people who feel marriage should be equal, whatever that term may mean, et cetera, et cetera. Um, tell us a little bit more about the, 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 the dangers, if you like, for people uh, who are of a certain persuasion dealing with these general technologies that are developed and made safe by people with a very different persuasion, maybe. Kind of speaking to the scale of the problem before us is, as you mentioned, the system was launched on November 30th. This is the third version, ChatGPT3. They're already working on ChatGPT4 because they become uh, better and more complex and nuanced as we move on. These machines are not going to get any worse in many ways. They're going to get much better and much more clear and much more uh, able to imitate and to reflect uh, the culture around us and the, sh the way that it's shaping and forming us through these technological means. It's interesting because about five days after the service launched, we were already at a million users. And by Jan by February, early February of 2023, the system had already, they had already reached a hundred million users, making it the fastest growing consumer That's application amazing. in the history of mankind, faster than any of the social media apps and any of the social media companies and technology companies uh, so that has a massive effect. As you said, it's a free account. Interesting enough, nothing's actually free, just as nothing is actually neutral. Uh, not only is it capturing data and using those type of things, especially in the UK and in the EU, there's a lot of data protection. That's something to be noticing and to be thinking about, about the role of data and the information that we divulge and uh, give over to these companies. So there's that aspect. But the other interesting aspect is the way that... Um, these technologies are built in many ways because interestingly enough, early on, you could ask the system what, it, you know, a question simple as what is a woman? And it would actually give you a very scientific definition of what a woman was. Um, interestingly enough, after some uproar, uh, that changed ever so slightly. It started to give a more what known as kind of a politically correct or something that would be widely accepted in terms of kind of the ongoing sexual revolution. And that's one of the things that we have to realize that these machines are not, not only are they not neutral, but they're also being influenced and shaped by human beings. These are products of a company with particular values and the coders and the developers and the designers and even the users also have particular values. And that's going to be communicated through the system. Um, again, nothing is neutral. It's not the, an abstract kind of objective look at things because early on, it's even changing its definition of, you know, if you ask it, what is marriage or you ask it, what does it mean to be a woman or what does it mean to be a man or what is the nature of the family? It's going to reflect a more um, what they would argue is a more pluralistic understanding, a very diverse understanding, but even specifically a much more progressive view in the terms of progressive uh, kind of the sexual revolution and a lot of the ideals of the LGBTQ plus I movement. Um, and so it's very, very interesting in that sense is the way it's shaping because not only is it shaping the way we interact with it often passively, but there are, there are human beings behind these machines. They were created by human beings. This, this didn't just kind of pop up one day. The AI didn't create itself. Itself. So you have those kind of embedded right into the design. Also, the data that it's bringing in is it says it scours the Internet. Well, it's also limited. And then that data had been cleaned up by human beings to kind of feed into the machine It's also done through reinforcement learning. So the the more correct answers it gets, it starts to build on that, starts to build in some type of bias. Now, bias isn't inherently evil because all of us are biased human beings in particular ways is we're discriminating, not being discriminating in the sense of a negative effect, but we all have to discriminate to say this is good or this is bad. These machines also do that. And there's reinforcement learning and supervised learning where the human being is kind of coaching it in some sense. And then it starts to be able to do it on its own. And there's a much more passive engagement. But even in that very question about what is a woman, you saw its answer change very quickly. And it's because it was 
baked into this, they went into the coding and changed things so that it would then reflect a much more progressive, or in this case, more of a kind of libertine type of understanding of sexuality and gender issues. And so that's really fascinating is in terms of how we not only trust, inherently trust these machines to be quote objective or to be quote neutral, which we've already said nothing truly is, but as we become overly reliant on these, we may not have the discriminating faculties or have the ability to distinguish fact from fiction or reality from a, uh, a much more kind of value-based uh, perspective on these things. And so I think that's helpful uh, for all of us in society to realize that we can't overly trust these machines. We can't even trust some of the basic data it gives in terms of facts and figures and things. It could be wrong on that, but also to know that there's a built-in um, influence in the way that it's progr- it's putting forth certain views um, that we yep. may fight contrary yep. or we may not agree with. And so we need to be aware of that as lest we step back and take a more passive approach and realize that, hey, mm-hmm. our entire worldview and philosophy has been shaped mm-hmm. by these machines and by these technologies, and we didn't even recognize it. Very good points. And we cannot emphasize how much th- it's, this is almost equivalent to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, in terms of information and 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 ability, so everyone now has ability uh, in terms of textual ability because these things will give you ability. Uh, they will they will give you information uh, t- to a to a very high standard, um, as if you'd done it yourself. And it's not plagiarized. It's all unique, uh, and it's based on on your questions and the way you've asked. But you're absolutely right. There is that caveat. So just to make people aware of that, which is I think a, a great service in itself, Jason. But so what do we what do we do? How do we how do we influence these things for good? How do we get involved in making sure that because there is a massive threat because these things you know we're familiar with things like Siri and Alexa and and other kind of AIs in the background which have been a bit clunky and not very good. This is something completely new, and it very quickly will become all pervasive and all dominating. Um, what can we do as individuals? Is there anything we can do? Um, to to stop stop these things virtually wiping out any discussion of of things that would be uh, close to our hearts and only talking about things that might not be. Yeah, I think a lot of this. There's kind of a couple of different points here. One, I would make sure we emphasize our agency and responsibility as human beings. No matter what we believe or belief systems we come from, is that we are moral agents. Um, and from a Christian perspective, I think we were created by God as moral agents that were morally responsible and accountable. Um, And there's that sense of cultivating virtue. And I think that's one of the things that we can do. And I try to do throughout all of my work is to encourage individuals and even families and churches and societies, synagogues, mosques, et cetera, to start to cultivate a sense of, of virtue of how we are to live in terms of cultivating wisdom. We don't need a lot of gut level reactions and kind of um, kind of weird arguments and kind of coming in, dropping in as if this is the brand new conversation and it just started to happen. There have long predated uh, these conversations or even these developments, many conversations and a lot of different kind of a history in terms of social media and internet, in terms of the role of the government, in terms of the role of individuals and thinking through that. So making sure that we cultivate wisdom when we start to interact with and also uh, shape the public conversation conversation surrounding these things. And depending on your political persuasion, you may see the government have a much larger role or a much smaller role. We may see certain types of regulation being in place. Um, And even here in the United States, we have a significant conversation over the responsibility of individual, these private companies in terms of what we know as the Section 230, which is part of the Communication Decency Act that says that uh, no internet service provider or application or technology company is responsible or liable for the content on their platform outside of some very specific kind of illegal cases. Um, But that also is hopefully to encourage them to pursue good faith content moderation. Um, Now, that's also a very loaded and debated term about what do we mean by good faith and what do we mean by obscene and lewd and objection, otherwise objectionable, especially here in the United States and for those around the world, especially in the United Kingdom or in uh, the European Union, you have different understandings often than we do here in the United States. Yeah. And and what's what's meant by this concept of harm? Because we're, we're going through a process now in the country looking at an online harms bill. And you've got to be very, very careful, you know, because... Uh, if, who who decides what what words are harmful and what words aren't, yeah. and who therefore is not allowed to say things because mm-hmm. it might be interpreted as harm? 
Yeah. And that's one of the things that, especially in the United States, we have robust First Amendment protection. We also have a robust First Amendment kind of doctrine that pervades over 250 years as a country that um, our courts have routinely over and over and over again uh uh, kind of weighed in and made these uh, decisions based on First Amendment in terms of free speech and free expression and also religious freedom. And that's not a luxury that we take, um, that we, um, you know, fail to see kind of the enormity of something like that. That actually shapes the conversation uniquely in the states around the world and that don't have as robust protections. And that's one of the things I think that's very fascinating in terms of these conversations is what role does the government play? Um, and there are wide debated understandings, even amongst pro-marriage supporters who would say, yes, the government has a larger role or a smaller role. Um, but specifically even here is to say, yes, I do believe not only cultivating personal and public virtue is important, but also holding these account these companies accountable. Much of my work is actually advocating am- alongside and to these companies uh, to change their policies, to have better policies that reflect true diversity, that reflect true uh, religious freedom and free expression that they champion in many ways around the world for some faiths, but not all faiths, especially Christianity. Yep. And I'm not saying that there's just an intentional targeting of Christianity, but given the prominent role that it has played in Western civilization, uh, there's kind of a, an assumption that that's not something we really need to protect per se. And especially when it comes down to marriage and sexuality issues, um, depending on, as you rightfully said, what do we dif- dictate as harm or what do we dictate as hate and hate speech? Interestingly enough, there isn't actually a legal definition of, quote, hate speech, um, not only here in the United States, but even around the world, because that's a very fuzzy and kind of a moving target often based on kind of social norms and social understandings and uh, social desires and will. And so those are some really interesting, I think the biggest thing that we can do kind of getting practical with it is to say, to be aware of the way that technology is shaping and forming us to slow down in a society that wants us to go faster, 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 and pursue convenience above all things and efficiency above all things to slow down and ask some of the hard questions of not only what technology is, how is it forming and shaping us? And in what particular ways may we be, um, uh, kind of weak or uh, maybe we have some areas that we need to strengthen in terms of how we go about not only cultivating personal virtue, family virtue, and kind of social virtue. And then having the conversations, much of this work that I recently published called The Digital Public Square entitled Christian Ethics in a Technological Society is asking some of these high-level questions from pornography to hate speech to free expression or religious freedom, navigating a lot of these questions from a particularly a Christian perspective, ethical perspective, But to say, no, these are actually representing much larger conversations that are happening in our society, whether you're a person of faith or not. These are important and all of us need to step into those conversations and be active because we can't keep technology kind of at arm's length as we often have for so many years to realize the enormous role that the technology industry has and these tools have in shaping our perspective of the world. Great. And just the idea that the the whole role of family and the reason why family is often such a threat to government is because custom and practice are passed on through families Mm -hmm. you know and to to carry on that conversation thing as you're saying put the phones down during mealtime and talk to each other have human conversations you know because we are still humans and 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 that makes a huge difference yeah and that's especially with the centrality of the family i think something we need to all keep in in into mind is that the individual and specifically the family are pre-political institutions, meaning they came before our governments. Governments are designed to recognize those natural rights and those natural understandings um, and the building blocks of society. And so I think we need to make sure that we keep uh, kind of a, a holistic perspective of the centrality of the family, specifically the marriage of a man and a woman in the conversation and how it shapes and forms society. Because when we give up or are lax on particular things, especially in terms of divorce and sexuality and a lot of uh, ex- exploitation or even pornography and things like that. It shows the widening world that, yes, we care about marriage, but only a particular form. And we kind of will gloss over some of the other issues that we're dealing with as this individuals and how that shapes kind of the larger conversation in our society, but recognizing there's a proper role for government in society, but there's a, a large and proper role for the, the church or the mosque or the synagogue or your faith tradition or no faith tradition or all, but even specifically the family and the building yeah. block of, yeah. um, of modern civilization. 
Absolutely right. And also, dare I say, get involved. I mean, I, I think you, you've got uh, a situation in the US where you've, you've got two parties and you've got one which is more traditionally conservative uh, mm -hmm. with a small C and one which is not. We don't really seem to have that anymore yeah. in the UK. There seems to be nowhere to go for traditional small C conservative values. Uh, to the extent that back in uh, uh, October 2018, one of our research companies, Comres, did a... Um, a, uh, an, an anonymous survey among our members of parliament. Um, and of those who responded, over half said they were too fearful to express their real views around some of these gender and sexuality issues. Uh, and that's quite, you know, when you think our lawmakers are too scared to say what they think, it's very important that we as individuals, we're conservative by nature, so we don't do it. But we need to do it to actually speak to them and say, this is how I feel mm -hmm. and I need you to represent me because, yeah. you know, my feelings are important. Thank you very much. So that's that's mm -hmm. a good thing for, that people can do is get involved in that, too. Yeah. And to be involved, as you said, kind of connecting with your local representatives, your electoral, elected representatives and voicing your concerns, voicing your perspective and yeah. also kind of developing even some uh, research and different organizations like yourself to be able to promote these things pretty widely to show that there actually are a lot more people who think there's an actual diversity in our society rather than the hegemony that often kind of presents itself yeah. is that we're all yeah, kind of on the quote right. right side of history. And the reality is, is that's not actually the case. And so we need to be aware of the way that uh, these kind of more uh, socially kind of progressive agendas are working their way into our conversation, presenting society as if it's a, it's a um, kind of a, uh, a very particular one kind of one-sided understanding yeah. of issues, especially as important yeah. as marriage and sexuality to show that there's actually a lot of diversity on this. And how mm. do we go about respecting in a more pluralistic society, have a principled position that recognizes other perspectives, um, but doesn't seek to prioritize one over the other per se, but seeks to uh, promote the common good, human flourishing, and specifically mm. the centrality of the family in our society. Now, th there's a lot of fear. We're, we're kind of wrapping up because I know you're a busy guy, but I know uh, people like Elon Musk have expressed fear around uh, general intelligence, kind of mm -hmm. uh, artificial general intelligence. And and there's a, a chat, Eliezer Yukowski, uh, another guy who, uh, you know, uh, basically says, well, it's going to obliterate humans because there's nothing that humans do uh, for which their molecules wouldn't be repurposed for something better by a general intelligence. <laughs> Pretty scary stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I don't know. I mean, that seems like years away. But and again, it's something that that um, non-Christians might not agree with. But maybe actually it will take uh, a general intelligence to actually tell us, well, actually, yeah, the purpose of man is to uh, worship God and enjoy him forever. And I'm going to help mm -hmm. you do that. And then that might be, it, it might take a general intelligence to come up with that answer for us mm. because we seem to have forgotten it ourselves. Yeah, it's really fascinating, that whole conversation. I have a whole chapter in my book, The Age of AI, Artificial Intelligence, and the Future of Humanity, asking questions about the future. Where are we headed? Interestingly enough, it doesn't matter if you're a theist or not. Um, it's actually a pretty high, uh, well-debated point of if we'll ever be able to reach an artificial general intelligence or a human-like intelligence. Also, some of the sci-fi kind of dreams of super intelligence, a godlike intelligence that surpasses humanity. I think there are good philosophical and even specifically theological reasons to say that we'll never be able to achieve that. But regardless, that doesn't change our status as human beings. Whether you come to this from a uh, theistic perspective or not, uh, many of the, in terms of when we talk about the nature of human rights, they're grounded on the unique nature of what it means to be human, that we have this status as a human being, no matter our cognitive abilities, our relational abilities, or even the ways that we function and the, the attributes that we model, is that all of us from the preborn all the way up until the end of uh, natural life have an inherent dignity, value, and worth because we are human being, and specifically from a Christian perspective, because we're made in the very image of God. That's what gives us that status that's bestowed on us. And so when we talk about a lot of these uh, emerging technologies, I'm not actually very fearful of the future for a few different reasons. One, I'm not sure that it's possible that we'll actually reach general level intelligence or obviously super intelligence. Um, so I think there's good philosophical and theological reasons to say we won't. The other part of it, too, is um, the nature of as we talk about what does it mean to be human and how we shape up these conversations is that there's something unique about that. So even more advanced machines that have better cognitive processing abilities or something like that than human being doesn't alter or change what does it mean to be human specifically. The kind of the last point that's very fascinating to me is that often these conversations kind of even you alluded to it. 
is that it's it's in the near future, but it's far off. It's typically, if you read the literature, it's interesting enough. General intelligence is always predicted typically, not always, but typically between 20 to 50 years away. And yeah. I think I was I can't remember the author who said it, um, but I thought they made a really astute point when they said that's just close enough that it feels like it's going to happen but far enough away that nobody will remember when you're wrong because we'll probably <laughs> yeah, be passed absolutely. away or not in the public yeah, conversation yeah. anymore. So it's always fascinating to say uh, the kind of the verdict still out is that thing, is that mm. kind of level of intelligence possible from mm. an artificial perspective? Um, but there's only one level of quote general intelligence in the universe and that's mm. a human being. Mm. Um, and so when we talk about that, that is something that's unique, but we also have to recognize our own inherent limitations as well as we don't make like God makes. We don't create like God creates. And there's something unique and different about that. But when you take a very um, simplistic understanding or even materialistic understanding, of what does it mean to be human? That you're simply just a kind of a product of your parts. Some of your parts are just a material being. Yeah, maybe that makes sense that we can create a, a general intelligence. But if you take a much more holistic view to realize you're not just that, you're actually something much bigger than that. That's where I think the conversation gets really, really interesting in terms of philosophy of mind and anthropology and how do we understand what does it mean to be human, which to kind of wrap our conversation is the central question, not only in terms of AI, but really all the moral and social issues of the day, including marriage and sexuality is what does it mean to be human? Is it an objective reality rooted outside of ourselves or is it something that we seek to create for ourselves? Yeah, uh, excellent. And excellent way to finish, really, Jason. I mean, the, the aside from the whole is, is a general intelligence Tower of Babel stuff, you know, mm. I, I think if if we can if we can get rid of some of the bias i think what what it'll show us very quickly is that there's there's a way which is good for mankind you know and the way is things like monogamous marriage finding a lifelong partner it and and the research is quite clear the social research the the the, the physical research that we're built for that we're designed for that if you like uh, and hopefully it won't be long before these ais are telling us look what are you doing? This is what you should be doing. It's much better for the vast majority of people. Yes, respect, love everyone, but actually this is the thing you should be promoting and doing because it just makes much more sense. Um, so in many ways, I think you're right. I think it's it's a great encouragement. I think once we get over this little hump of, of bias and inputted bias to protect people's feelings and we get through to the real detail and the real use of these things, it'll show us how great things like marriage is. And so that's mm. a great point to finish. Jason, such a privilege to talk to you. I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, what, what have you got um, uh, hanging over you in the future? Any, any, any good uh, schemes or, or mm. books you're working on? I always have a couple of projects I'm working on. I just finished up, as I've kind of referenced a couple of times, a book called The Digital Public Square, which is all about kind of content moderation and the nature of the public square. It's an academic volume. Interestingly enough, it's not just written from a U.S.-based perspective, but we included some international voices, oh, especially good. some friends in there in the United Kingdom, to provide kind of an international perspective on technology policy and how we can shape that um, specifically as people of faith and Christians. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the projects. I'm also working on a larger project on human rights and digital privacy and to say Very what good. is it what is a right to privacy and how do we yeah. think about that as human beings as yeah. long as my ongoing yeah. work on the podcast and the newsletter yeah. and writing a lot about these pressing moral and social issues of the day great well i'm going to keep tracks on you and find out what you're doing and assuming general intelligence doesn't destroy us uh, i'd like to get in touch with you again sometime and have another great sure. chat i'd love that jason what a privilege thank you very much for your time jason thacker yeah thank you for having me